Hello, everyone. Thank you all for coming to part three of the Cello Tech Talk series. Um, so, as you know, Cello Tech Talks is one of many Cello Foundation's efforts to share and spread Cello technology, Cello technology knowledge with the Cello community. I'm Judy Piper, your host for the um, this Tech Talk shows, and I'm also an engineering partner at C Labs, and I'm currently based out in Berlin to lead and grow um, the engineering team here. Back in April, John Resizer and an application engineering partner and myself kicked off the first part in Cello Tech Talk series with a high level technical overview of the Cello platform and wallet. We talked about how the team at Cello Teams, um, C Labs, has been working on mobile first blockchain platform to build a financial system that creates the conditions for um, conditions of prosperity for everyone. Last month, during part two of the Cello Tech Talk series, Josh Christ, a product engineering partner at C-Lab, showed us how to simplify blockchain development with the Cello SDK and how you can start developing your own dApps on Cello platform. So for those who missed the first two sessions, we have the recordings available on Cello Foundation's Crowdcast as well as this um, Cello YouTube channel. So be sure to check them out. And in today's session, Tim Morton, thank you, Tim, for joining. A protocol engineering partner will give us an in-depth overview of Cello protocol and its um, proof of stake. Cello's consensus and proof of stake mechanism have been one of the most requested sessions. So I'm super excited to have a um, team here today. Tim, before we start the session, could you please introduce yourself and share how you joined C Labs? Thank you, Judy. Yeah, hi everybody. Um, uh, I'm Tim Morton. I'm a partner at C Labs. I uh, co-lead the engineering on the Cello uh, protocol. Um, I joined C Labs and started working on Cello about two years ago. Um, prior to that, I uh, ran a number of cloud infrastructure services for Apple, including Apple's monitoring system, uh, most of its big data pipelines. Um, I actually, like, I guess uh, Cello was, um, beginning to work on Cello was my sort of most recent foray into the blockchain space. I actually, a long time ago, did a PhD on peer-to-peer um, -peer and very large scale uh, distributed systems where I thought a lot about the sort of um, economics of like how you make systems where there is no sort of central ownership really work. Um, and so this is like, it's quite fun to be like working in this space again. Um, and obviously a lot has changed since then. Um, yeah, so I'm going to take a foray through um, proof of stake consensus and all of the pieces that help hold the uh, process of figuring out like what, how to modify the blockchain and like agreeing on global state. Um, there's a l so much to cover here that um, we're already going to be able to like uh, take a sort of a slice of, of that and maybe like go into detail in in future talks. Um, so yeah, let me uh, just try and figure out where. Oh, my windows are gone. There we go. Okay. So uh, talking about the agenda, so I'm going to give a very brief introduction to um, to Cello, uh, talk about uh, the networking layer, how we actually allow validators to communicate and find each other, um, consensus briefly about how validators uh, communicate and agree uh, on updates, and then proof of stake, which is really the mechanism by which we, in a sort of decentralized permissionless setting uh, determine who gets to play this sort of privileged role in the system of being a, a validator. And so there's like many aspects of that. There's looking at like this construct of validator groups that we've introduced, um, looking at how uh, voters um, like uh, play a part in the system through a system called locked uh, what was previously called Locked Gold, uh, I guess now renamed to Locked Cello as the uh, ticker tokens we've been renamed, um, looking at how validator elections actually work and the mechanics of that. Um, rewards, obviously a big part of being a validator is, um, you know, you incur a lot of cost and play a big, uh, have a res certain responsibility in the system in terms of uptime. Um, and so there are rewards associated with that, which we pay out on a 
uh, the end of daily epochs, and then penalties as well, because you know it's important that validators do continue to do their role for um, the sort of continued running of the system. So, find my pointer again. Um, as Judy mentioned, the CELO mission, the mission of the project is to build a monetary system that creates the conditions uh, for, for prosperity for all. Um, and this, this really starts with um, empowering anybody with a sm smartphone anywhere in the world to have access to sound currency and to be able to participate in basic financial services through their phones. Um, so that means like, you know, maintain a balance, send money to friends and family by your phone number, be able to use your phones to pay for goods at stores. But to be able to do this all on a decentralized platform um, that is developed and operated by the community and that can uh, you know, form the foundation for a whole range of new services for apps from managing savings and micro lending through to products that like nobody has really thought of yet. Um, so, you know, that's a there's a pretty uh, ambitious mission and uh, it has really takes a sort of whole or I think at least the philosophy of the solo project is it takes a whole a whole sort of full stack approach to be able to um, deliver on that and that means combining like a uh, like first class wallet experience a front-end experience uh, on both Android and iOS um, to present something that's simple enough that people barely need to understand that there's a cryptocurrency behind it um, through a SDK, which allows developers to um, build such like front ends on top of the um, protocol itself. And then a uh, protocol on the back end, which is really optimized for mobile clients um, and has a number of things which are and supports a number of things which are missing in a number of other like layer one protocols so in particular uh, great on-chain governance so we can develop continue to develop and change it with agility an identity protocol um, to allow people to um, find others just through their uh, phone numbers or other sort of identifiers that they understand um, and a family of stable coins so that the uh, the value that's represented in these wallets is in terms that are sort of familiar with them on an everyday basis. So, yeah, how does how does that relate to proof of stake? Well, um, one of the one of the the, the, the challenges there is um, looking at how do you deliver the sort of throughput. Um, and um, yeah, um, so in fact, before I before I dive into this, um, I think it's probably worth mentioning. So to, to help us get there first faster, um, you know, Cello took as a starting point for its layer one um, solution, uh, Ethereum in particular, the Golang based version of Ethereum, um, Go Ethereum. And you know we're indebted to the Go Ethereum community and the Ethereum community in general um, for providing this su such a like strong starting point. Um, one aspect of Ethereum that we identified as being potentially challenging for reaching the particular goals of the Celo project is um, around Ethereum's use of proof of work. And what do we really mean by that? Well, blockchains need to have some answer to like the the problem of updating shared state. So in a blockchain, this really means like who gets to decide like what the next block in the chain is, who gets to like apply transactions that are coming in to the current state and build another block and have that accepted by the network as a whole. Um, and so, you know, there are two broad different uh, different schemes sort of to two sort of families of scheme that are like commonly talked about for, for doing this proof of work as in Ethereum and Bitcoin and um, proof of uh, stake. So I think it's worth like before we sort of dive too much into proof of stake, just sort of comparing these and making sure that um, the sort of properties of these, these, these things are clear. Um, so in a proof of work scheme, like nodes compete to solve a computational puzzle which consumes the vast majority of these nodes compute powers and that, that thereby sort of entails like high electricity and energy usage too. So the chain of blocks that is accepted as the current state is more or less the one that is longest and would cost the most energy to rewrite. So 
Um, network security relies on no one organization acquiring like a majority of the uh, total hashing power of the network. And so being able to conduct what, what termed a 51% attack. So that means that users of a proof of work network are in effect like paying for miners whose presence rarely results in transactions being processed, but instead prevents like the takeover of the network. So this definitely works in practice. Like you can see through Bitcoin and Ethereum that it's a um, it, it's a scheme which has been proven out in in a in a in a, in a public uh, setting. Um, but it does mean that the higher the security, the higher the cost, and the higher the environmental impact. Um, so in a proof of stake blockchain, um, there is a sort of somewhat different approach whereby rather than any node being able to come along and um, like essentially do work itself to compete for the chance of being able to add a block to the blockchain. Um, a consensus, like a sort of well-defined consensus algorithm, usually one that is tolerant of nodes failing or acting in an arbitrary or so-called Byzantine fashion um, determines updates to the blockchain. And so validators in a proof of stake system only really do I guess what I would call like useful work. Um, the network, uh, this 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 allows the network to deliver um, higher throughput, and uh, it allows the sort of block rate to be um, more predictable as well. Um, and so the network is secured by basically having two thirds of validators like faithfully execute this uh, BFT algorithm. So when a quorum is achieved, that block is final. So you get like immediate finality as well. Um, but a BFT protocol on its own would not work for a fully decentralized and permissionless system um, because BFT protocols rely on some external mechanism to determine like who these validators are. Um, so one of the... Um, one of the challenges is that BFT cannot scale, like BFT algorithms that are well known, cannot scale beyond a few hundred nodes at most. So the Celo mainnet has launched with 100 validators, for example, um, and may look to increase that to you know 120 or something like that soon. But um, in any case, like the number of possible participants is, is relatively modest. So it cannot like encompass all of the participants that proof of work can, but it. It means the cost of picking validators badly is really high compared to proof of work. Like in proof of work, a node can just go away and it doesn't matter. In a proof of stake system, once you've elected a validator and that validator is participating consensus, you really do want it to behave properly and not get hacked and to uh, not go down. So uh, yeah, so proof of stake is also a like a way of attempting to align the incentives of validators with those of the networks. So they overlay this consensus algorithm with a way of holding potential validators funds in a type of sort of a smart, like for us, a smart contract escrow um, as, a, as a sort of stake. And uh, then we use a mechanism like in Celo and Election, I'll come and talk about that, to basically accept some of these um, registered participants as validators and then to reward them so while also incentivizing like other nodes to detect and prove misbehavior so for which these validators would be would be slashed a portion of their stakes um, so yeah so there's some definitely interesting like ways you can compare these two schemes um, like from a user's perspective at much lower cost you can have more predictable block a more predictable block rate, um, immediate or immediate finality, uh, higher transaction throughput, lower environmental impact. From a network perspective, you have to think about like the challenges are really around um, decentralization of, and building this permissionless on ramp, and really making sure that validators, once elected, are doing what you're hoping they would do. Um, cool. So that's sort of like a, a high level um, uh, scene setting <laughs> exercise. 
Uh, then we, I'm going to go on and talk about like some of the things we've, we've done and some of the interesting pieces of sellers proof of stake scheme in three different layers. So the first is networking, second is consensus, and third is like this policy layer around proof of stake. So networking is really answering the question of like, how do you, how do, how do nodes find each other? How do validators like, uh, find each other? Um, consensus is once they found each other, how do they like, agree with each other to update the state of the network and then proof of stake is once you've got this sort of functioning network how do you build this policy layer where or rather this you know to some extent this like game theoretic mechanism around how to incentivize and select new uh, validators um yeah uh, cool networking so, um, yeah, so like Ethereum, Celo uses a sort of unstructured overlay network where every node maintains a sort of set of peers um, and passes messages between each other. And anyone can like come along and, and join this network. Um, the most numerous um, Types of node in this network will be light clients, which run alongside the wallet on every user's mobile device. Um, and these light clients use full nodes to answer requests for account and transaction data and to uh, forward on like you know new transactions that the application is sending. Um, and yeah, then there are full nodes which um, are servicing those light client requests. Um, there's an incentive scheme that the team working on Cello is working on um, and is, is sort of uh, is, is an interesting opportunity to like have a permissionless on-ramp to earn cryptocurrency and provide some service in the network. Um, but I'm, I don't have time to sort of go into detail on that today. Um, and then the, the sort of like pictured at, at the middle of the network here, um, are this sort of like um, uh, this 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 like set of validators, which are basically regular full nodes with an option turned on to participate in consensus as well. So they look very similar from a code base perspective to full nodes. Um, and of course, these validators are not really actually physically all like together in this in this topology. Some may be have joined and be communicating to each other through like other other four nodes. Um, so yeah, so as as we'll see like later, BFT consensus results in a significant blow up of messages between nodes. Um, and also the latency between validators is absolutely key to being able to reach agreement rapidly, um, especially as the number of validators goes up. So on the flip side, you could look at that as like efficient communication between validators is critical for being able to scale the validator set. Um, so Celo does not, unlike some other systems, Celo does not rely on gossip for um, distributing consensus messages. Instead, it builds like a fully connected mesh between all of these validators. So all validators are directly connected to each other. But it does this in a way where um, it uh, where it doesn't allow or we don't want other nodes necessarily to know the locations of validators. So you have this problem like where validators look just like full nodes on the network. Everybody knows the address, i.e. the identifier of who these validators should be. And these validators may pop up anywhere in terms of like the, their presence on the network. And we want them to be able to find each other, but we don't want anybody else necessarily to like know where they are. And so to tackle this problem, uh, we uh, put together uh, an announce protocol. And so I'm gonna sort of step through two versions of the announce protocol. Uh, the first, which we ran for the um, Great Cello Stake Off, for the sort of um, uh, beta test net that, um, was operated between sort of December and March this year. Uh, and then, you know, talk through some of our learnings from that and changes that we made to it um, in, uh, in sort of consequence of those learnings. So the first version of the Announce Protocol, basically 
uh, you know, you're in this setting whereby everybody has found out um, the addresses, as I say, the, the identifiers of the validators um, and like their like public keys essentially, but uh, doesn't necessarily know where they are. So the way that the first version of this scheme worked is that basically uh, every node periodically gossips a uh, an announced message throughout the network and this contains like this big message contains basically one entry for every other validator it's expecting to receive this message and that entry is encrypted with the public key of that target validator um, and the entry contains like the the e node essentially the identifier ip and port of the source node so I send out a message which has like, basically every other validator can read a small portion of this when it receives it and find out my identifier. Um, so yeah, if you screw forward, eventually these messages arrive at other validators and the validator um, uh, decrypts the one entry that's intended for it, installs a new entry in its validator enode table, this like thing on the, on, on the far right. And then it can establish a peer, a direct peer connection with the um, with the first node. And so this means that even if validators don't join in a way, which means they don't know about you know any other validators. In fact, they're only connected to like some random full node. Um, they can eventually find each other and build this complete mesh between them. So this worked. Uh, it's actually worked very well for the snake off, um, and it worked pretty nicely until we like did some careful inspection of or maybe not that careful maybe it was a bit obvious but anyway we looked at the amount of bandwidth that was getting consumed by validators and you know we heard a couple of reports of validators isps disconnecting them um for like you know going down because they uh, had exceeded bandwidth caps and things like that We're like hmm what is going on here uh and so yeah, we 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 recognise that basically um, there is a, 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 a there is a sort of inherent tension in this scheme um, because this data is really changing. I, as a validator, probably are not going to change my IP that often um, when I join, when I leave, um, when I am exposed via a new proxy. Come on to talk about proxying in a minute. Um, or when I like my identifier will change when I do key rotation. So there's a few sort of situations, but they aren't that common, um, but it is, you know, there are sort of, uh, you know, when I do change my identifier, I want everyone else to know about it um, quickly. But the other thing is that it consumes a lot of bandwidth. Gossip is like not a particularly, um, uh, you know, bandwidth efficient uh, scheme. And um, this is sort of exacerbated by the fact that only a small part of every message is relevant to any one node because, you know, we are encrypting payload to every different public key. Um, so yeah, and then worse actually, if you um, if I change my network location, you then have to wait for this gossip protocol until you actually hear, and hear about it through the gossip protocol, until you actually believe me that even if I connect to you directly, you'll believe that I've like, I'm, I'm somewhere else. Um, so we took, a, we took the opportunity before mainnet to um, improve this protocol and um, it is now somewhat more complicated to understand, but it um, is has has a couple of really um, really great advantages. So now on joining, whenever a node changes its network location, it, it sort of or you know, so you join or you change your network location, you increment a sequence number um, and sign it, which creates what's like basically a new announced version certificate. And nodes maintain a persistent cache, like uh, just locally, of the announced version certificates that they've received from all other nodes and including their own and new or updated entries to this are just periodically gossiped. And so every node in the system is sharing, hey, I believe that you know, my view on the versions of the E nodes of all the other validators are as follows. And so what this means is that nodes can rapidly learn from each other about when changes occur uh, and so like when this happens when like you know a new node joins um 
this node two finds out about it, it doesn't immediately know it's enode, but it can send this message, this, it can gossip this message back, which is a query message, which is saying, hey, I'm here, please can you like connect with me? Um, so I'm a validator too, and I'm gonna send you my details encrypted to your uh, public key. And you know, when that comes back, then that node one can like appear. And so this has some um, this has some real advantages because uh, for the amount of data that gets gossiped is like orders of magnitude lower, which means we can gossip it more often. And it also means that as soon as once once a node is it deals much better with this sort of asymmetric case whereby one node knows about the other, but the others moved or changed. And in that case, because the peer the peering mechanism now actually exchanges a certificate. Which include, which basically proves that you're a validator by signing with the validator key or your actual identifier. Um, um, oh, actually, yeah, uh, doesn't include your identifier, but basically has a certificate, uh, which means that you're the the you know you connect to me out of the blue, and I can immediately tell whether I should be treating you as a validator and accepting this connection or not. So yeah, so th this is what the uh, Solo mainnet uses. So now, once you have this announced protocol, you have like every validator talking to every other validator. Um, but you don't really want these validators all to be exposed on like the public internet. And so we also support um, proxying. So a scheme whereby um, you can run what looks essentially like a full node and uh, hide a validator behind um, a proxy. In fact, um, yeah, at the moment we support only one proxy, but the protocol will soon support like multiple proxies. Um, so yeah, so this um, basically, I won't go into the details of like the sort of message exchange protocols here, but um, just to say that basically the the um, validators share the validator eno table with the proxies and they sign and out certificates for them. And in the multi-proxy scheme, like each remote proxy is like handled by a single peer um, that's determined by a consistent hashing scheme using the remote peers identifier. Um, and so what that means is that if a proxy fails or you wanna add a new proxy, only a minimal number of peer connections would change. And this is exactly one of those situations where the remote peer establishes the identity of the new peer using the announced certificate. Um, this diagram also shows an attestation service. It's not really part of um, the proof of stake scheme so much, so I won't talk about it too much, but basically it's part of Solo's identity protocol and it allows validators, um, so validators are the folks who are running these um, to get paid to direct text messages to prove new users uh, access to a specific phone number. Um, yeah. Cool, so that's the networking layer. We have all the validators talking to each other, um, all the validators hidden behind um, a set of uh, proxy nodes, uh, nobody other than the validators easily being able to identify many of those um, uh, many of those validators. So now we need to do some consensus. So uh, like a number of other proof of uh, proof of stake schemes, uh, Celo uses a form of uh, practical Byzantine fault tolerance. It's like in the family of PBFT algorithms, um, originally described by uh, Miguel Castro and Barbara Liskov. Um, there is, uh, I guess like, like Tendermint, the main observation here with blockchain systems is that you can, PBFT is relatively simple as an algorithm on paper, um, but has a, a ton of um, implementation challenges and uh, also a complicated, what was called a view change protocol, um, and which you can sort of more or less sidestep when you're building it for a blockchain system because the output of what you actually agree at each step is the sort of is a block which is like can, is sort of the entirety of the global state. Um, so a new validator joining only needs like the latest block here. Um, our uh, fellow's uh, implementation is based on EIP 650, which is a implementation of a form of practical Byzantine fault tolerance called 
uh, Istanbul, not to be confused with the Ethereum hard fork, also called Istanbul, which was, the so EIP 650 was never merged into the Ethereum code base, um, but, um, and was definitely not production hardened in any way, but um, more or less like served as a good starting point uh, for us to, to, to use. Um, we have made like numerous changes to that and number of improvements, many security and performance improvements, um, also a bunch of like changes to ensure liveness, uh, inspired by some of the work that the Pantheon now BESU um, client team did on uh, IBF2, IBFT2. Um, so yeah, I'm not gonna talk in too much detail about um, the like how consensus works there's like that would be like an entire talk in itself but i mean broadly validators broadcast signed messages between themselves in a sequence of steps uh, to reach agreement like even when um up to a third of the total nodes are uh, offline faulty or malicious um so basically um yeah, new validators are elected each epoch, as we'll find out. Um, a source of on-chain randomness allows the protocol to like shuffle the order of these validators. Um, validators take turn to propose blocks in this like well-defined order. Um, and so, you know, initially each node is in this like accept request state. Um, they receive a pre-prepare message um, from the proposer they're expecting. Um, they then move into this pre-prepared state. They broadcast prepare messages um, that sort of match what they saw in the pre-prepare out to all the other validators. Um, once they've received back prepare, in fact, prepare or commit messages uh, from 2F distinct validators. So there's a 2F plus one. Um, so a, a sort of two thirds of, of uh, have replied, including themselves. Um, they move into this prepared state where they then broadcast the commit message um, to all the other validators. And so the commit message includes a BLS signature over this block. Validators in Celo not only have like a regular Ethereum ECDSA type uh, uh, key pair, but they also have a BLS uh, key, which they use to sign messages. And the reason for that is that once you receive your commit messages from uh, you know, other validators back, um, you can aggregate on the left of the slide over here, you can aggregate um, all of those commit messages into the, um, a single BLS signature seal, an aggregate seal. Um, and then what happens is the blog gets published, it gets gossiped around, you know, and whether you published a block or whether you receive a block um, in through the, the normal channels, you um, then move on to like the next sequence, the next S here is sequence, the next sequence and, the, and produce the next block. Um, obviously lots of things can go wrong in this process, timeouts can happen, um, messages can be invalid and so on. And that's where it gets into the, into the sort of, um, into the details. But uh, yeah, that's, that's the sort of the high level piece. And yeah, so this is, um, this is, deployed on mainnet. Mainnet's now uh, over a, a million blocks. Um, consensus between 100 machines takes around a second. Those machines are distributed between uh, a range of different um, locations and, in, in fact, continents. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it, um, we, we do, the consensus typically takes about a second um, for, from an overall like five second block time. So, um, so the validators have found each other. They um, can execute this algorithm to uh, to basically uh, add transactions to the blockchain and add blocks, you know, add transactions to a new block and produce that block and get it agreed and verified by other validators and add it to the blockchain. Um, now uh, we got to figure out how do we choose those validators in the first place? So, yeah, um, I want to introduce some 
concepts here. So we talked about validators. Uh, from proof of stake sense, validators are uh, a sort of um, not just a node that is actually performing BFT consensus, but is actually a uh, a sort of a data structure, if you like, that uh, represents a node ready to participate in BFT consensus. Um, it's really like associated with a, an address, you know, and then later uh, a validator can come along and actually like fulfill the role of that data structure by providing, um, by being able to sign messages on behalf of that address. Um, so validators to, to participate in BFT consensus, um, they need to uh, get elected. The Silo protocol runs an election every epoch, which is a certain number of blocks, which roughly um, lines up to about 24 hours on, on mainnet. Um, in the election, votes are not made for individual validators, but instead for validator groups. Um, so a validator group has members, which are an ordered list of up to five candidate validators, and each of which must have chosen, chosen to affiliate itself with that group. Um, so the group may add or remove or reorder members at any time, um, but depending on how many votes a group receives, anywhere from none to all of its members may get elected. Uh, and validator groups are compensated by taking a, a portion of the, the validator rewards. So we'll talk about rewards um, a bit later. Uh, and then on the left, you have users. Um, as a decentralized platform, there is no real way of like identifying who users are, only really identifying accounts. And so, Anybody can generate any number of accounts, and um, you know that's that's a challenge in a conventional voting system, right? If you can just pretend to be a lot of people, um, what they can't do is just generate assets. So to resist so-called civil attacks when uh, users create multiple accounts or multiple identities and vote with each of them, or where they can transfer assets between accounts and vote multiple times with the same funds, we require accounts to look up. Um, cello and so essentially escrowing it and use that to vote and you know it's one unit of uh, cello equals one vote and crucially unlike a number of other proof of stake platforms voters lock cello funds are never slashed as a result of misbehavior of validators they have voted for so the users funds are never at risk and the reason we made that decision is, uh, well, let's let's talk about that in a moment. So, yes, yeah, so the same lock, same locked cello mechanism is actually used by both validators and validator groups, as well as like voters. Um, and validators and validator groups use it to um, put up a stake, and so that is the stake which is at risk if um, uh, if they uh, get slashed. Uh, and they can actually also use that stake to vote at the same time. So, cool. Um, so I think it's worth just reiterating the roles of these three groups and making the network secure and highly available. Um, so yeah, the network's interests are best served by selecting validators running on secure hardware with good monitoring and undergoing regular audits. Um, so operational security best practices is totally critical and something like entirely in control of like um, validator admins. Um, the, because BFT only scales to a few hundred nodes and can tolerate only a third malicious participants, every validator um, or every insecure validator, I guess, must have a, could have a significant negative effect on the performance or security of the network. So it's really important that we that the the mechanism as far as it can um, uh, ensures that validators are doing all of the things that uh, that uh, would make it hard for them to get hacked or to go down. So this means like you know good physical data center security, monitoring, alerting, and so on. So it's not always possible for users to tell whether a validator is doing all of this stuff. Um, so 
Cello introduces the concept of validated groups. You know, the idea there is precisely to like address this. So groups could have like distinct identities from validators and you know, groups will be able and incentivized to build up long-term judgments on their validators, operational practices and security setups. The idea here is that it's much more possible for a group to be able to um, ensure that before admitting or after admitting a validator, one of its you know one of its five validators, that it is following all of the best practices, um, and you know it has a real identity. Um, we know who they are. We background check them. Um, they're they're not out to like damage the network. They're they're gonna. Um, they're going to be like a, an asset to the network overall. And so groups own some sense of these gatekeepers so that um, uh, like end users do not have to like, who do not have like the, either the time or the inclination or the ability really to be able to determine um, to determine this, like to just basically to help tackle this information asymmetry. Um, so I, I guess uh, a little like uh, parties in an election. So, yeah, and then like the this this bit is also interesting because it may not be like totally obvious to everybody. Um, the network is secured by voters locking up seller and selecting groups that maximize the rewards and that they trust, making the cost of influencing elections uh, prohibitive. So, really, what we're trying to do here is, yeah. So the protocol doesn't necessarily rely on holders of cello being able to make great decisions about which validators most diligently rotate their keys or you know whatever um it relies on them making the relatively easier decision about selecting a group that uh, performs well and that they trust that basically has a good reputation um, and in turn that group has vetted and has incentives to carefully vet the validators that are part of it um, cello holders earn rewards if they vote for a group that has one or more validators selected. And those rewards are structured to align like um, uh, cello holders incentives with validator behavior and performance. Um, and, you know, there's this, the, the, the really interesting part of this is the critical one critical way in which rewards the cello holders result in network security is the just the act of locking up Cello and therefore reducing its liquidity um, means that it becomes prohibitively more expensive to purchase large quantities of Cello in order to uh, influence the election or like elect malicious validators. And so really the role of gold holders here is to <laughs> is in, in, in sort of locking up cello, the, um, rather than having those funds floating around, um, is, is to make it expensive to, um, to, to, to swing those elections. Um, cool. So, um, yeah, so just to come back to like lock cello, so used for several things concurrently, voting for validated groups, staking for val stakes for validators, stakes for validated groups, um, and also voting on governance proposals, which uh, we have an on-chain governance mechanism, but I'm not going to uh, talk about that um, today. So just quickly how um, the process of like locked cello works. Um, so the idea here is that if you want to um, participate in, uh, in, in in the system, you can like uh, lock three cello at a uh, smart contract. You can then use that to vote. Your vote moves into like this sort of pending category. You vote for a group. Um, um, you then need to activate your vote. The reason you need to activate your vote is that um, uh, it moves from this category of pending vote under the hood it moves from a category of pending vote to a category of like uh, activated vote whereby your vote is converted into essentially like units and by activating your vote you're um purchasing units of um uh i guess what looks like a sort of 
uh, a different, um, a sort of something somewhat different. And the reason for that is that we, uh, as we designed this, we wanted to ensure that the uh, rewards that you received compound automatically on uh, votes. And so when you earn rewards, you, those rewards are applied back to the votes that you have for your group. So um, they'll essentially be automatically reapplied and the number of votes that you're making to the group you're voting for is, is automatically increased. And so when somebody else wants to come along and vote for that group, in order to buy in to the, to, in order to like vote, they receive fewer units essentially in exchange. And so that's the way that the compounding mechanism works, which is why it's necessary to have this additional sort of activating step. Um, later, you can unvote um, and the units are converted back into uh, regular lock cello and you can then unlock them. You can either vote for another group or you can unlock them um, and collect rewards that way. So the let's talk about how elections work. Um, so yeah, um, validators are selected according to the de Hont method, which is a form of proportional representation. The first slot is assigned to the validator that's like ranked first in the group receiving most votes. And then at each step, the process considers like the highest ranked candidate that has not yet been selected from each group and elects the one that would maximize the average votes received over its group selected validators. Um, and so, yeah, there's a, there's a luckily, um, Nam, who works at C-Labs, uh, built something which visualizes this very, um, very nicely this week. Um, <laughs> is it going to work? Okay, maybe I'll share it afterwards. But the, um, yeah, the, the, the idea there is that, um, the requirements are sort of different from a real world world election, right? So they you're aiming to translate like voter preferences into into representation, but you're also looking to promote decentralization and um, create this sort of moat around well performing like elected validators. So there's sort of two design choices that maybe are like that are counterintuitive, but like but affect this. So there's a limit on the maximum number of member validators that a group can list. And there's also like a cap on the number of votes that a group can receive. And so that in particular is not something that you would typically see in a regular election, right? Like, sorry, you cannot vote for this candidate because they've already received too many votes. But if you think about it, um, votes in excess of the number of votes needed to get the sort of like least voted for validator from that group elected, um, doesn't like improve network security in any sense, right? So if everybody were to vote for like the um, top validator and very few people vote for, um, you know, validators two through uh, 99 or um, however you want to um, sort of think of it, um, those, it, it would be very, very cheap to um, for an attacker to supplant to 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 get a malicious node elected, um, because they would just need to supplant the least voted for validator, not the most voted for validator. So from that point of view, what you're trying to do is um, you're trying to make it as expensive as possible to get the validator at the bottom of the list out, and the way you do that in an ideal setting is just have every validator receive the same number of votes. But of course, like, you know, you also, um, that there is sort of this trade-off whereby you need uh, voters to be able to express preferences around um, uh, which groups they believe are doing a good job or which groups ought to be trusted. So um, 
yeah, so that's something which is like unintuitive. And it seems like this thing isn't loading, so I'll just have to try and show it afterwards if it's time. Um, okay, so we looked at proof of stake, we looked at the various actors in there, we've looked at how like locked gold allows voters to um, uh, lock cello up and participate in elections, and we've looked at the actual mechanism of how an election happens. Um, why would you bother do any of this? Well, you'd bother do it because you get rewards, of course. So um, there are several classes of recipient of um, epoch rewards, validators and validator groups. So validators receive um, rewards, uh, which we'll come and talk about in a second. Um, and uh, validated groups take a proportion of that, like essentially as a group share or a, as a commission. So the way that groups incentives are aligned with validators is because the rewards they receive are um, go up and down as validators rewards go up and down. Um, so locked cello, uh, typo there on gold. Uh, so locked cello that elects a validator um, also re receives epoch rewards. And then there are several other recipients um, of, um, of epoch rewards as well. A community fund, a carbon offsetting fund, and um, the reserve. So um, yeah, I, I will come back and talk about those at this time. Uh, so rewards to validators and validated groups. Um, there's basically like um, a sort of fixed there's this sort of tension between um, attracting great validators who are going to secure the network and paying too much to validators, which essentially comes out of the pockets of end users or other uh, of, of cello holders. So there is sort of a tension there. Um, rewards to validators and validated groups are denominated in uh, stable currency, so in CUSD, and the reason for that is that most of their expenses are uh, anticipated to be in uh, stable currency. There is this notion of an on-target reward, um, which is a flat amount of uh, $75,000 uh, cello dollars per year, um, obviously pro rata because these are things done every epoch, um, every day. And then there is a sort of notion of um, like overall spending of epoch rewards. So you see the second column here will adjust the down or up rewards based on whether the uh, fixed supply of cello gold um, is being sort of additional cello gold is, is being minted towards that total fixed supply faster than the schedule or slower than the schedule. And depending on which that is, like rewards can actually be increased or decreased above this target level. Then there are a number of factors which contribute to the um, rewards actually to um, the validators. So this is the notion of a slashing penalty, come on and talk about that in a minute, but like one of the things that happen if you um, get slashed is that your future rewards are reduced. Um, there's an uptime score, we incentivize validators who uh, sign blocks, and this is like a major component of the of the rewards. Um, and then once you've figured that out, then you take a slice off um, for this group share, so to pass it to the group, and then um, uh, the remainder goes to the validator. Um, so validator, uh, validator uptime. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned, um, the protocol tracks a valid an uptime score for each validator. When a validator proposes a block, it includes in the block body each signature that it is received from validators committing the previous block. Um, so for a validator to be up, up for this metric at a given block, it must have had its signature included in at least one of the previous 12 blocks. And so, Validators essentially have to be online and sign a block once every minute uh, for to not have any um, sort of negative effect on their sort of uptime calculation. The uh, so so 
what we do then is um, apply this through a sliding window. So if you look at this sort of diagram, you see four different validators. You can see um, blocks that they have uh, signed going like across and a sliding window um, being used to compute whether uh, a validator has actually like uh, uh, like signed, uh, signed that block. And then basically this moving average, um, this moving average is calculated, which means that um, yeah, downtime of less than a minute doesn't affect your uptime score, but downtime more than a minute uh, can affect it rapidly. So next step, looking at rewards to uh, lock cello that elects uh, a validator. So if you're a voter and you um, uh, vote for a group that elects at least one group at least one validator you get receipt and you receive rewards um the level of rewards that you receive is targeted at around six percent in the main net right now but it's actually a function of um the amount of locked gold that is the amount of like locked cello or cello that is actually of the circulating supply that is actually locked up so the reason for that is, as we talked about before, we want a certain amount of circulating supply for purposes of liqu liquidity, but we also don't want that circulating supply to be too high such that if uh, an attacker attempts to purchase a large amount of cello, that it would get very, very quickly, uh, very expensive for them to swing an election. And so, um, Basically, the rewards go up um, if you know to make it more attractive for users to lock up lock up cello. If we're not at that target, and if we're over that target, the rewards go down to make it less attractive. Um, so that percentage, currently set at like around fifty percent, I believe, um, determines like this on-target reward. So um, you know, six percent is like the on-target reward if everything is like looking good around uh, and and. We're about 50% of cello is uh, like not in the reserve is, is circulating. Um, and then we do the same thing as previously where we look at whether we're overspending or underspending against like the sort of uh, the epoch rewards target. And that determines like the amount that we'd um, will be like passing through in the best case. So then there are a couple of deductions. So the slashing penalty is something that we, uh, I'll talk about in a second again. And then the uh, as voters are also voting, you know, are voting for a group, we look at the average uptime score of the validators um, in that group for uh, this current epoch. And that is the uh, and, and then the re rewards are like reduced by that proportion as well. And so if you're voting for a group whose validators are up all the time, you are going to be earning more than if you're voting for a group whose validators are down. So um, validators, not just from the point of view of their own rewards, but also from the point of view of attracting votes and keeping elected, um, have strong incentives to ensure that their uptime is good. Um, how are you on time? Not great. Uh, con so penalties, there are several different categories of penalty. Um, and I will uh, talk super, super briefly about this. Validators are removed from, can be removed from a group. So if you're down for a, like too long in an epoch, we just flick you out of the group uh, and you can get added next epoch. But the reason for this is that down validators that have just gone away are um, problematic, especially in test nets from the point of view of um, allowing the network to continue because um, block production will halt if you get to a point of more than one third of all validators being down. And so um, removing validators which have been down for a majority of an epoch from a group is a strong protection against that. Um, 
yep, you may, as a validator or group, you may lose a fixed amount of your stake. And then there's also this slashing penalty, which is, as you've seen, a multiplier on the rewards. Um, every time you get slashed, um, this value gets halved and your rewards get reduced, which um, has consequences for both your returns and for voters that may vote for you. Uh, and that has to apply for 30 days. Uh, and once you've not been slashed for 30 days, you can send a transaction to reset that value to one. Um, categories of offense, double signing, um, won't go into talking about that too much now. Um, persistent downtime, already talked about that. And also by governance. So through a govern the on-chain governance mechanism, you don't have to be doing something which is, you know, like if you're trying to like game the system by finding something that's bad, that is not explicitly um, in the protocol, um, something that you can get slashed for, but the community decide that your behavior overall is something that um, is uh, has an adverse effect, then you as a validator or a group can get slashed through um, a community vote. Um, and yeah, in real life, maybe I can quickly uh, show that visualization that I was going to show earlier. Um, yeah, so this sort of gives you an idea about like how the election mechanism works. Um, so this is mainnet right now. Um, so you can see the number of votes here. Um, the votes with, uh, so the first um, validator in that group uh, is the first thing to get elected. Um, and then at each stage, we're looking at which, which next validator has, which, ne which group has the, the highest number of votes um, averaged over the uh, validators that they've elected. So you see at some point, you see here, after 7585, the um, first entity here has uh, more votes than the, uh, the the sixth entity coming up down here. Um, and so its second member gets elected before that one. And so as you can see, this sort of pans along like this. Um, and it becomes, uh, uh, yeah, and so on. Um, Great. So I will try and figure out how to share, stop sharing my screen. There we go. Excellent. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, and thank you, Tim. Um, we are a few minutes over. And if you have still time, um, stick around for Q and A's. We do have four questions posted. Um, while team takes a look at the uh, questions posted, um, I'd like to remind everyone that uh, next session um, in July 2nd, Mike Straka, who is a crypto engineering partner, will talk about Solar Plumo. Um, this is a new ultralight validation protocol. So if you're uh, interested in learning more about how C-Labs team is a scaling Solar blockchain, syncing and validation for resource constrained mobile devices. Please be sure to register and join the session next time. Cool. Um, yeah, so sorry for going a bit over. Um, I am just rolling back through uh, looking for the questions. Um, cool. So does proof of stake need an actual blockchain? Can we have validators vote on log updates to a database or file system? Um, that is a interesting question. So yeah, that's an interesting question, which might require me to think about it for a little bit. Um, I mean, in some senses, uh, 
Byzantine, a BFT-based consensus is essentially like agreeing updates to a log or like any form of consensus algorithm is agreeing um, updates to the end of a log. And proof of stake is really like the sort of policy mechanism that determines who gets to participate in that consensus algorithm. Um, so yeah, you could you could separate those two things and build something that does what you suggest. Um, is there a control technically for transactions with questionable gas prices, like a two dollar transaction with gas worth a million? Uh, interesting question. No, not right now. Uh, it's worth saying that our gas pricing mechanism is, is different to Ethereum's. Um, and uh, yeah, more details are available at docs.cello.org. But yeah, at the moment, there is nothing to prevent you providing a gas price that is too high. Would you mind explaining again why BFT algorithms don't scale or work well in permissionless settings? Yeah, so there's two things there. So first, why don't they scale? They don't scale well because um, the they have several steps where you need to broadcast messages to every other participant, and then you cannot move to the step afterwards until you've received responses from two thirds of those. And so, um, if you think about it, that's like an, uh, an, uh, an like that algorithm entails you sending um, like. It, it, you know, in the sort of setting that we have at the moment, we're already sending like tens of thousands, like 10,000 or so messages, um, I believe, for every round of consensus. And that goes up with the cube, I think, if you, uh, as you add new validators. And in fact, it isn't actually just the number of messages. In some like edge cases, it's the size of those messages as well, for like complicated reasons I won't get into. Um, but yes, it's difficult to like, have um, like not very few systems are have been able to scale BFT like beyond that. So we have um, done some work on a uh, mechanism called BF tree, which you can find, um, which is looking at how to scale BFT to um, many more validators than like hundreds, but it's still research at the moment. Why doesn't it work in permissionless settings? Well, it's really just that if you can only t uh, tolerate up to a third of nodes being faulty or malicious, and faulty includes just being not available and not responding to messages, um, then every one of those, and, and you know, n equals 100, then what you're talking about is having like potentially 30, you know, thir the 34th node being uh, controlled by an attacker, 34 nodes being controlled by an attacker, um, meaning like your network uh, block production grinds to a halt and being able to take over you. Uh, and, 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 you know, having two thirds, 66 or 67, um, meaning that they can make arbitrary updates to the blockchain. And so from that point of view, you can't just keep adding new nodes because you need them to have some kind of incentive to be up and to do the right the right thing. Um, and so that is what sort of proof of stake is all about, making sure that the um, nodes that participate in your consensus algorithm um, are the right ones, the best ones. I think that's uh, all the question we have. Um, thank you, Tim, for joining uh, and then providing the, the overview of a proof of stake today. And for those who uh, joined and there's more information on our um, cello doc, uh, docs.cello.org page on the proof of stake and as well as the consensus. And the team also has a medium post on um, this very topic on the proof of stake. And I will send out the survey after this session is over. Um, if you can provide the feedback on this session as well as um, any topics that you want to um, learn more from this session, um, please feel free to fill out the session. So thank you everyone for joining.
I'll also say just finally, um, I will go hang out on our Discord channel, uh, chat.cello.org. And if anybody has like follow-up questions, I'll share the links there as well. Um, please come join me in chat. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye.